Hello again, and today's lecture is going to be on digital filters and on how we start actually designing for these filters in particular. So any generic transfer function, be it in the Laplace domain, the time domain, or the digital domain, or the discrete time domain, basically is that if they respect to S or Z, they have some sort of frequency response associated with them. So as of such, these transfer functions, they act like a somewhat like a filter, where they filter these input signals into, the form, into some form or fashion as required. So let's say we had a generic first order transfer function here, and we asked, okay, how do we find the frequency response for this transfer function? <coughs> so the generic approach would be that we convert from h of z here to h of j omega. And then we plot accordingly our response for every instance of omega here accordingly. Now, doing this by hand is very long and tedious, but we're going to see how we can do this in another form in particular when we're designing for these filters. If we wish to do this method in particular, there's an automated tool known as FDA tool in MATLAB that will give us this magnitude frequency response and a phase frequency response for this transfer function or any transfer function in particular. <coughs> in reading this magnitude frequency response graph, we can see here that around the center frequency, we have a huge magnitude of around 35. But as we keep on going towards multiple increments of this center frequency, we can see that there's a steady exponential decay. To mean that the magnitude decays across as we increase in frequency. So in particular, we can design transfer functions to get particular frequency behaviors that we may want or we, that we may expect accordingly. And digital filters, or, or these transfer functions in particular, process only digital signals. So from here on out, we're going to examine the design and behavior only for digital filters. <coughs> so the transfer function here, respect to Z, is basically just a model. And the real discrete time system operates on a dis difference equation, which can be mapped from the h of z equation here, into h of n, and accordingly we can formulate a y of n equation here with respect to x of n. In particular, recall that y of z is basically h of z and x of z. This is how we do the mapping from h of n to y of n. <coughs> Any difference equation that is given in terms of y and x, being outputs and inputs, they tend to have a frequency response. So let's say we had a generic sinusoid signal here that was sampled, and then we introduce a noise spike here on this part accordingly. We want to see how we're going to filter out that noise spike in, a f in the next few slides. So let's say we have this difference equation here. So the question is, what does this difference equation do? In particular, what this does is just it averages three values in this case. These three values here are going to be the x of n, then x of n minus 1 delayed by 1, and x of n minus 2, which is delayed by 2. And these three values here are then divided by 3 here by this incorporated fraction on outside the brackets. This sort of filter is referred to as a moving average filter. Um, we're going to apply this filter equation, or this filter difference equation, to the previous signal that we just observed. If we apply it to that signal, the original signal here is seen as the blue line, which had our nice noise spike. But the filter signal here, it reduces that noise accordingly and gives us a more accurate representation of what the original signal is supposed to look like. The next question we want to ask is, for this moving average filter, what is going to be the frequency response? So the transfer function for this moving average filter is just basically a direct transfer, because we have delays here from x sub n going from n equals 0 to n minus 2. So we could transfer this accordingly, straight, just by visual, watch, visually watching it. x and n will transfer to 1, the first delay is z to negative 1, and the second delay is z to negative 2. x of z here indicates 
that the transfer function is mapped with y and x to give us our h. If we cross multiplied, we are got back our x of z here accordingly for each one of these delays. The spectrum of this, if we convert this to h omega, because remember h is basically y on x, is that all these z delays here now become e to the minus j omega accordingly, and for this one here, it's going to be e to the minus 2j omega. And if we do some equation manipulation here, and we use our geometric progressions, we can get h of omega here into this form. If we plot the spectrum of this entire transfer function here in z, to get our h of omega frequency response, the spectrum looks like this here. Where at the Nyquist frequency, which is at the center, we have a mitigated magnitude, but our silo frequencies here maintains the magnitudes accordingly. The zero crossings basically are going to be when omega is equal to 2 pi divided by 3. So the zero crossings are mapped on to this fraction here accordingly, and it must be an integer multiple of 2 pi. So. In commenting on this, this is basically a poor quality low pass filter. Because the ideal low pass filter response can be seen here by this red dotted line. So the moving average filter is only good for when we uh, uh, want to filter out the magnitude or mitigate the magnitude here for the center frequency or the Nyquist frequency. For all the frequencies, it's just, it isn't that good. We just want to maintain the same magnitudes accordingly. So as of such, a moving range of filter, being a low-pass filter in particular, it removes some of the high-frequency components of that noise spike. And it works in this case because of only the high-frequency components getting filtered accordingly. If we put it down to having the generic or gener general response of any moving average filter with respect to N, we basically see that the Nyko frequency is always going to be at the center point, no matter what. So, in this case, if n was equal to 6, the Nyquist frequency is around 3, and the zero crossings are always going to be on 2 pi divided by n. Now, even though the moving edge filter is generally a sort of low quality, low pass filter, it actually is very useful for first pass responses. So, as of such, they are used quite frequently in smoothing applications to remove high frequency information from the signal. To design this filter, all we just need to know is where the first zero crossing is going to be, and this gives us the value for n. So let's watch this example here, where we need to figure out what is the order of the filter that is required, meaning our n term, and as of such, we know the full null occurs at 4 kHz. As a such, once we know what the equation is, we can just catch a generic frequency response assuming a sampling frequency of 12 kHz. Our zero crossings are basically are given at capital omega equal to 2 pi divided by n. But we also know that omega is a function of common omega multiplied by the sampling time. If we map those two equations together, we can get common omega here is equal to 2 pi divided by nt. <coughs> so as of such, if we make n the subject of the formula here, we can see n here is equal to 2 pi divided by common omega multiplied by t. But this is also similar to the sampling frequency divided by the null frequency that we saw in the question. So we just take the sampling frequency, which was 12 kilohertz, and divide it by the null frequency, which was 4,000 hertz, or 4 kilohertz, and we get 3. So n in this case is going to work out to be 3, which is going to be our third order moving average filter. If we sketch the frequency response, it's basically going to be that at the null frequency that we observed in the question, we have the steady decay here up to the null frequency, and then we have our nice mitigated amplitude here to the center frequency here, which is going to be f of s divided by 2. In this case, it's going to be 6 kilohertz. The transfer function for this filter is basically given by the difference equation. Because it's an n term here, and it's, the n was going up to 3, 
That means it's going to be 1 divided by n, which is 1 divided by 3. And then we have three properties here for x. So it's going to be x of n, x of n minus 1, and then x of n minus 2 all summed together. And we can compare it with the general form here that we saw in the 14th lecture. The block diagram for this, because there's no feedback, is just going to be a full feed-forward system. So this will be our no delay, our first delay, and then our second delay. n, n minus 1, n minus 2 accordingly. And everything just feeds from the input straight to the output, no feedback. So a moving average filter is a good example of what we refer to as a finite impulse response or FIR filter. And like I said, because there's no feedback, this actually is a good example or a good property of seeing how a feedforward structure forms a finite impulse response filter.